right, what's going on, adventurers? We are doing another episode of the Adventure One podcast from the land of Rona. <laughs> In the times of the coronavirus, where everything is weird and sometimes people wear masks and sometimes they don't, and who knows what the heck's going on. Sometimes you get kicked out of restaurants for it, too. <laughs> yeah, We've that, been there. That, that story to come. So today I am joined with... Uh, we're joined by my buddy Daniel, and we practice social distancing by driving basically a lap around the state of Texas. <laughs> we went pretty far, and it was well worth it. And what we made sure to do the entire time is literally stay away from everyone else. Yeah, except each, we were probably like within three feet there of each other. There was definitely the no social time. distancing there. Yeah. <laughs> But this all came out of, so we've been doing a little bit of long range shooting, a little bit of shooting anything and everything. Heck, on my channel, there's a video of us blowing up a couch. Daniel was like, hey, I got this old couch. You got Tannerite? Let's go. <laughs> that was pretty fun. Uh, and then that turned into kind of his deer lease that had no deer on it, us just stretching it out, practicing with the rifles. Um, and then this weekend was just a chance to go down to the lease, do some hunting, uh, do some long range shooting, just pack in a whole lot of experiences all into one weekend. So going into it, I remember there was really three goals that I had. Number one was I had seen Pliny uh, two weeks before he was sending me text messages and saying, Hey, I'm down at my lease and I'm shooting at 500 yards. I'm like, man, that's cool. I want to get out to 500. Hey, just had a personal best record at 700. That's cool. Hey, I'm going for 900. Hey, I'm going for 1,000. I'm like, man, I want to go down there and shoot to 1,000 yards. So that's kind of how this started. I was like, hey, let's do it. Yeah. Well, and it, and it was fun. Um, so I, I had never shot that far before. I'd shot to 600, I guess, two or three times. And it, it was fun. And I got to the point where I was feeling pretty confident about it. So I wanted to really stretch it out. I knew my rifle could get out there. So it was good to go down there, experience it. Also, that trip, um, I... I got a pig when I was actually filling my feeders. I think it's pretty rare for me to, I, I haven't had a situation where I felt like I've lucked into it in a while. And that when I was just filling my feeders, looked over, I'm like, what's, what's that little black speck over there? Oh, another one. Oh, oh, another one. Oh, there's pigs all over the place. So I got out, I had my target rifle cause I had just come off the thousand yard range. And so, you know, I had previously been dialing 8.3 mils for a thousand and three yards and then there's a pig at 80 yards. I'm like, ah. Hopefully you dialed it back just in time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Set that thing on zero. Just and shoot 20 feet above the pig. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Set it on zero and put it through the ear hole, buddy. <laughs> nice. So that was my experience two weeks ago. And then Daniel and I had been talking and we're like, hey, it'd be pretty cool if you basically came down here and did a lot of that stuff too. But then you also had another hunting goal. So I had three goals, like I mentioned. The first one was I wanted to get to 1,000. And then I haven't shot a pig in a while. And so I really wanted to take a shot on a pig. So that was kind of my second goal. And then the other goal I had, which was kind of the fun one for us, was uh, we've been talking a lot about probably for the last month, let's go do an axis deer hunt. Well, actually, probably for the last six months, but really for the last month, we've been looking at let's go to a ranch, let's find a, a good deal, and let's go do an axis hunt. And so that was kind of my third goal is, hey, let's do the trifecta, 1,000 yards, pig, Axis, yeah, and some people see all the axis hunting. Basically, they see, they watch all these big hunting shows, and every June, July, somebody posts axis hunting episodes, and it's they are running around a significant area in South Texas, but they're still kind of rare to see. Um, and so, I was hoping they were going to be on my lease. One guy on there got one, but he's also the only person who's even seen one on there. So our thought was maybe we'll go down there and happen into one. But if not, um, let's go ahead and just kind of reserve a spot at a place where they know they're seeing them with an outfitter, uh, somebody who's kind of got it on lock so we can go get that hunt done. So we started the, the typical way that Pliny and I start any hunting trip, which was Pliny tells me he'll be at my house around 1 or 2 o'clock. And about 4.30, he rolls around and comes by. I show up, I knock on the door, and I say, ah, I forgot my boots. <laughs> <laughs> There's always something, and I love it. So I think you came by at around 4.30, and your lease is about six, six and a half hours away. Yeah. So you came by. We, uh, we ended up taking off. 
got outside of the the big Metroplex Mixmaster. Yeah. Um, I think we had to stop a couple of places. Oh, man, I feel like getting out of Dallas it is takes like forever. the first third of oh, it. Oh, gosh, it takes forever. <laughs> or Fort Worth. I, I don't know. I run into more trouble in Fort Worth than anywhere else, yeah. like traffic-wise. So, so we get out, and then, of course, we're, I don't know, probably three hours in, and we're both like, hey, we could eat. So I had, I'd only eaten one thing that day. I'd eaten some Chick-fil-A. And uh, quite naturally, we decided to say, hey, let's go to Chick-fil-A once again. So there's a Chick Fil A restaurant we hit the last time we went down to the police. <laughs> yeah, it's in was it Brownwood or early somewhere around there. Somewhere around there. There's a billboard <laughs> that on the left side of the highway that says "Turn right now," and there's a weird Chick Fil A in a mall that does like delivery to your car outside the mall. It's the weirdest. Thing. You're like literally in the parking lot, going through cones. You order from somebody, and then you pull up on the side of the mall like, I'm going to go in and get some new sneakers, but they bring Chick-fil-A out. Somebody pops out of a secret door with a chicken sandwich. And And it's delicious. It's weird, but the world's all good. It works. And we're still not sure if that sign says, turn right now, or if it says, turn right now. (laughs) We're we're also not sure if it's really Chick-fil-A or if it's just someone in the back hooking up some chicken nuggets. Yeah, but either way, whether it's a legitimate franchise or not, it did satisfy. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. So we got that. And then we had to stop and get corn or something. Groceries. Yeah, yeah we got groceries, point. corn. Uh, we basically pulled the trip together on the way down there. <laughs> Felt well, like <laughs> I remember we stopped at the Walmart uh, about three minutes before they closed. And they were not afraid to tell us they were closing in three minutes. Yeah. And then they said, I asked, hey, where's their grocery store? And they said, you can go to Lowe's. And quite naturally, I said, no, I'm not looking for a hardware store. I'm looking for a grocery store. Yeah. But in that part of South Texas... Oh, yeah. Lowe's Country Market's definitely a, a West Texas thing. It totally is. So we went to there. We got... And it's... Actually, that, took, that was an adventure. Yeah. It took us about 20 minutes to get two miles down the road. Yeah. But... We got there. We got the uh, the groceries we needed, and we headed on down. Yep. And then... So we got down to Junction pretty quick. All right. Then after that is where I feel like... Kind of at that point, it started getting interesting. Well, it was funny because because Plenty had mentioned... He said when he was you, you said you're driving down there, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, and you decided to do a challenge. And the challenge was from oh, junction yeah. to Rock Springs, I'm gonna every time I see a deer, whether it's alive or dead, but every time I see a deer as I'm driving, I'm gonna restart a counting clock. Yep. And I think you said you got to how 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 many seconds? I got so this was like the way I because I had been telling people there's so many deer down here, and I couldn't think of a good way to describe it. And this was the weird system that I came up with. <laughs> so every time I saw a deer, I would start counting. And I would count until I saw the next one, just to like, get an idea of what's the gap between deer here. In 45 minutes, I never got above 34. <laughs> so quite naturally, Pliny's telling me this, and I'm going, there's, no way. <laughs> there's no way. There's no way. So he's like, let's start the game. I said, okay, great. We're, we're you know, we've, we've, had the last five hours in the car together. I don't think there's much else we can cover. We've covered everything from religion to politics, and that's about all there is. So we started the game, and quite honestly, I don't even think we got to 34 You're seconds. Like, Seven? Shit. There's another one. <laughs> oh, that one's dead. Does that count? Yeah, that one counts. Damn it. All right, restart the clock. Yep. And then we got down. We passed the South Llano River once, and then we passed it again. It's very swirly and curvy in that area. And that's when I, I remember I was telling the story. I was like, it was just past here where I saw a big tank of an axis just oh. standing right on the side of the road. And you made me a, a kind of non-committal bet that by the time we got there, we would see at least one axis and one black buck. Yep. And I was, you know, we're... Probably in a high fence standing on the side of the road. Correct. Yeah. And we're probably, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes outside of where we're going. We hadn't seen either. I'm like, there's no way. Yeah. And then the story commences. Yeah, so I had just been telling the story, and then we were driving south on 377. And, you know, we've been seeing deer on the side of the road for the last hour. So I'm kind of going slow, um, got my wide beams on, just trying to be a little bit careful. Then we see a deer step out of the side of the road and just come just trotting across the road, not not running, not full steam, just kind of sauntering along. And it was a stud it was of an massive. axis. It was, and I remember, because I'm obviously on the passenger side, and it came from my side. Yeah. And I'm like, dear, dear, dear. And it's just standing on the side of the road, starting to walk. And I'm like, that thing is not going to... We're probably going, I don't know, 45, 50 miles an hour. 
And he was just, he had no care in the world. He's and like, I'm, I'm going. Breaking, not slamming on the brakes, but breaking decently hard. And he just, he comes strutting out. He was probably at least 30, 32 inches. Yeah. He was a big old buck. And he was fat, too. He was fat. He looked like a square body buck. Yeah. And I remember saying to Pliny, so it was amazing to watch it. He goes by. We kind of were just like, holy shit, did you see that? We were super <laughs> excited. Obviously, it's it's the good hunting omens, right? And I said to Pliny as we start driving, I said, hey, Pliny, if you could replay that, would you hit that buck with your truck and throw him in the back? <laughs> and ultimately, my conclusion was no, but I had to think about Tempting. it. Tempting. Yeah. Tempting. Yeah. So that was the first of, I think, five or six really cool things that happened on that trip. Yep. And that happened 45 minutes outside of the lease. Yeah. And then as we kept going in, actually, we saw more whitetail, and then we saw two more axis on the side of the road as well, live, not yep. dead. Um, it's just standing there looking at us with their kind of skitzy, I'm about to jump right in front of you kind of look on their face. And then there was another, remember there was another whitetail that we turned a corner and he was sitting right there about to jump yeah. out in front of us. Yeah. And that was, uh, that was interesting. And we're just like, don't do it. Yeah, don't, don't do it. Stop. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> so then we got onto the lease and man, this place. So this is down in Edwards County and Edwards County is an open range County in South Texas, which means if you own both side of the ro- sides of the road, you're not required to fence in your cattle. You can let them free range across the road. And so across this county road, they have all these bump gates. And previously, I would stop, get out, take a ratchet strap, push open the gate, tie it up, drive through, go back, untie it, let it slam shut behind me, take off. And there are six of these gates. And so the last time I down, I was down there, I had already you know messed up my bumper a little bit. Not bad, but it's just sitting a little bit askew from hitting another deer. But (laughs) that's a different story. I mean, you drive in South Texas long enough, you're going to hit a deer. Mm -hmm. It's just the rule. Um, So I just got mine done with, hopefully, for good. (laughs) But my bumper was already a little bit messed up. So mentally, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get like one of those cool aftermarket bumpers, like a rough country or a ranch hand or something. So I'm like, yeah, I don't really care if my bumper gets scratched. So now I just slam through the bump gates. So (laughs) that makes it significantly easier getting into this place. Well, it took 35 minutes down to about three. Yeah. Which was wonderful. Boom! <laughs> yeah. So just push on through. Um, got in. Uh, did anything else happen before we got to the cabin? I think we got set up. Yeah, I think we, we, we didn't see anything else of interest. Yeah. Got to the cabin, turned on the water, turned on the power. And that was probably about 1130 when we got there. It was pretty late. Yeah. Because we had, we had stopped a couple times and we were both kind of looking at it going, man, I'm tuckered out. It's, it's time because we're going to wake up at... Four thirty, five o'clock in the morning and try to get out there and see what we can see. Yeah, and man, that's a difficult thing about summer hunting. Like you think about how early you need to wake up in the winter, but that's when the days are short and the nights are long. In the summer, you still got to wake up just as early, but yeah. the summer days in June in Texas are long. Yeah. So I think we woke up at five and we were still cutting it kind of close. Yeah. Not, not bad you could start seeing your hand in front of you when we were getting into the blind yeah so i think we were about right but any later would have not been good. yeah so but what's crazy is so we wake up we go out we get in the blind and literally we're sitting in the blind for less than five minutes and two doe come out oh and this is after i realized that i only had one chair in my box blind so i went (laughs) down to my bow blind and raided that chair and and got that. So I had walked like right through the middle right of this through. thing. I'm like, yeah, it's dark enough. I can get away with it. And as soon as Pliny sits down, we're looking going, man, there's there's deer coming out. Yeah. Like immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So these two doe, I think it was two, and then there ended up being like five or six that ended up following them. Yep. They were probably, so the, uh, let's take a step back. The box blind is what, 15 feet up in the air? Somewhere around there? Probably not even that. Probably 10. 10. So 10 feet up in the air, and we're looking out, and probably 15 yards, maybe 20 yards out, a little doe comes comes across, and, and uh, Pliny had told me earlier in the day, he's like, hey, all those little bushes that were out there, I cut them down so that we wouldn't mistake 
you know, <laughs> the classic, hey, I got I got sights on something and it turns out to just be a bush. Well, and that – it's just funny. <laughs> Daniel was laughing when I told the story because I think it was just like, yep, that's how Plenty handles this. Like, remember that bush that we always thought was deer? Yeah, cut it down. <laughs> <laughs> Took it out. Took it out. So we so we see these deer coming across and quite naturally we, we know they're deer. Yep. And uh, they start coming out and then, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of just – Putzing around and getting close to the feeder. And then all of a sudden, you know, three or four more deer come out. And before you know it, the sun's kind of coming out. And then the feeder goes off. And we've got probably six to eight deer that are out there just looking around, eating. And uh, we were out there an hour before the feeder. It's not just like, at least that time, it's not like they were just coming in because they heard the feeder or something. It was kind of a cool, they were all doe. Yep. Uh, kind of a cool thing. You know, you, you uh, haven't seen a deer in six months because it's not deer season. Go down there and all of a sudden you see six or eight deer and you're like, man, this is kind of fun to watch. Yeah. And I think for me, any hunting trip, like the first goal is seeing something. Absolutely. Like even if I can't shoot, if I go down there and I see something and I get to just experience nature and just sit there and watch it, that's, pre- that's pretty cool to it's me. It's pretty cool. And, and some people, I don't know. Maybe you get to a point in hunting where like that's not as cool anymore. But for me, I'm like, nah, I can just sit down there and watch the world wake up. And that's pretty, cool. pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> we're sitting there for a while. And then uh, I don't know who spotted her. But in kind of off to the left-hand side of us, uh, we see this, this probably bigger body doe mm-hmm. come out. And we're like, man, wonder what she's doing all the way over there. She's not coming into the feeder. She's not just, with the rest of the group. Not with the rest of the group. She's on the edge. And then all of a sudden, and I'm going to say this and I don't care. We see the cutest little fawn yeah. come out. And she, I, this thing is tiny. Yeah. It's got the white spots, the red coat. And it comes out and it's and it comes and the doe's kind of looking around, making sure nothing's there. And it just comes and starts nursing. And yeah. it was it was a really cool thing to see. And that fawn was just like so happy, like mama's back. <laughs> yeah. So, but still like, you know, awkward and wobbly and <laughs> couldn't get his steps right. Hadn't quite figured out the leg <laughs> thing yet. <laughs> yeah. So the the fawn's nursing for a while and that's you know, so Plenty and I were sitting there going, Okay, so we saw something cool the night before with these big access buck, uh, and then a couple others, and then we're seeing something cool here and we haven't even started shooting yet. Which, like, <laughs> that's amazing, right? And then I remember distinctly, it was probably, I don't know, probably five or ten minutes, the, the fawn's nursing. And then it comes over to the side of the doe, and Plenty and I are looking at it going, what is that doe doing? It looks like she's trying to, like, scratch her back. And what she was doing is she was licking the fawn's face to clean it up. Yeah. And that's when I made the comment, I've got, you know, three kids, and, and my wife is an amazing mother. And I made the comment that it doesn't matter, animal kingdom or human kingdom – the the mother always takes care of the young, and that it's not it's so instinctual. It's maternal. It's there, and and they're just they're taking care of the young. So that was that was actually a really cool thing to see happen. Yeah, that was that was like it's the sort of thing that you you know you get on Instagram and just spend an hour just like scrolling, staring at your phone, totally wasting time, and you see people posting pictures of like oh cool fawn out there, like you're like oh that's cool, but to actually see it firsthand. Yeah. With a fawn that was probably born within two to three days yeah. of when we were sitting there in that area. That was cool, man. That was really cool. That was really cool. So we sat there for a little longer. Uh, deer ended up clearing out. And then we decided, I think it was probably 8.30 in the morning, 9 o'clock, because we had been there for two or three hours. Yeah. And then Pliny's like, hey, let's. Uh, you want to go do some stalking? There's a pond that's on this lease. And so we're like, yeah, let's let's get let's get down, let's go stalk and see if we can find some pigs. And yeah, we were just going to kind of go see if we could happen to find something. And for anybody who's hunted a lot in South Texas, you'll you'll get what I'm saying. But it's like simultaneously wild open, but also like the thickest impossible stuff ever. It and, and that's what makes it really difficult because there are times where like I couldn't imagine a shot beyond fifteen yards. Yeah, and then there are some times. I mean, we're out here and we stretched it out to basically a kilometer. We we'll get into that in a minute. So it just all depends on like exactly where you are as to how open it is. So like, well, we'll just go wander around um, based on how hot it is. Going and checking out the only water source on the property is probably a pretty good place to look for pigs. 
Yeah, and it was kind of cool because we parked on the, so there's this pipeline which we'll get into in just a minute. Um, that had just been dug and, and they put an oil pipeline in it and what six feet of, of gravel on top of it, something like that. And so we parked there and uh, we switched rifles from you know my 270 and Pliny's 270 to I pulled out my AR 15 with a uh, an EOTech on it and a 3x zoom and Pliny because Pliny's a bow hunter pulled out his compound bow, which I just thought was really cool. And so we're like, all right. The pond is kind of over to the left from where we were. So let's just kind of meander down there. Let's get into the woods and see if we can get down to that pond and see if we can uh, be quiet doing it and stir anything up. Well, hold up. Before we got out and pulled out switched weapons, do you remember what we saw running down the pipeline? Oh, my gosh. That's right. So we saw it was three black buck. It was two does and a male. And it was the craziest thing. So keep in mind, that's a really good point. Keep in mind, we had just seen this tiny little fawn. And so there's, there's, a, there's a black buck buck. And by the way, for those of you that, that think that black buck are black, they're actually not. Yeah, a black buck is a tan antelope. And so I was very surprised by that because I'm looking at it going, he's like, Pliny's like, hey, do you see the black buck? I'm like, no, I see a couple of deer. He's like, no, no, those are them. I said, no, they're not black buck. They're, they're tan. Yeah. And, but that, that was them. So we see them and the truck kind of startles them up. And all of a sudden we see them running and we see this little fawn running alongside. I'm like, oh, that's cool. It's another little fawn. And it's they a, got one too. Yeah, the black buck <laughs> had one too. Pliny's like, dude, that's not a fawn. That's a jackrabbit. Yeah. And sure enough, that was Huge. one of the, that was a <laughs> massive jackrabbit. So he's, he's hauling with them. He picked up and goes, oh, they're running? I'm going to run too. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go, Thumper. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that's right. That was, a, that was a funny part of the story yeah. too. Well, and, and so we had been down there looking for exotics, but on this property, so that's, you know, we're down there to deer hunt. It's a deer lease and they like us taking as many pigs as we can. But the landowner is very particular about the black bug. You do not shoot the black bug. So they're just kind of scenery, <laughs> yeah. I guess. And they're cool. I, it, so plenty, every time we go down there, he says, hey, you're going to see the black buck in this area. And I think probably uh, probably 75% of the time we pass through there because it's, it's, it's an area from his, his uh, blind back to camp. Every time we pass through there, probably, well, probably 75% of the time, we see them sitting there. And they're usually two or 300 yards out, just kind of staring, not too concerned. And we get close and they take off. Yeah. But it's, it's cool to see no matter what. Well, and they're an antelope species, not deer. So they, they can see incredibly well. They can outrun just about everything. They don't really have predators down there. But they like hanging out in the wide open. So that just means they're, they're good eye candy for anybody passing down that pipeline. You get to see them. So it was yeah, pretty cool. That was pretty cool. So anyway, that, that was kind of an interesting aside. But we got out, switched weapons to some more, I don't know. Practical, yeah. short-range weapons, yeah, I guess. That's yeah. a good way to put it. Well, yours is probably more practical. Mine's just like, ah, I'll throw a stick at something. <laughs> but with a big point on the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which I'm I'm testing out a new broadhead that I'm really excited about. Can't get into the details of it quite yet, but I I'm pretty excited. But we got out, started walking around, walked down towards the pond, um, found it, kind of snuck around, found a cattle path that walked around it. Um, didn't see anything on the pond. There's always a chance. Just four cows looking at us. Yeah. What are you guys doing? <laughs> this is our water hole. <laughs> yeah. Do you want some water too? Because I pooped in it. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, but we got down there, walked around. So we're like, yeah, we'll just swing along, you know, loop around the pond. Went kind of up on this hill. Found kind of a cool spot on that hill that we're like, yeah, if we were going to try to do kind of an overwatch on this pond for pigs, this would be a pretty good spot. Basically, within 300 yards, you kind of see everything in that little, not really valley, but everything kind of in that little depression where the pond is. But something to kind of help that make sense. So on this lease, we've kind of carved it up. So each leasee, we all have our own areas, but the pond is kind of no man's land because we decided in South Texas where it's so arid, it wouldn't be fair if one person had all the water and the others didn't. So generally, it's kind of a sanctuary for deer, but for pigs, yeah, smoke them in the water. <laughs> Who cares? So it's kind of cool because we're we're sitting up there, and um, you know it, it's not a huge uh, valley, but you can definitely see down. I don't know. There's some elevation drop, and we found this wide open area where um, it's probably I think it was 220, 230 yards down to the pond, and we're sitting there going, "Hey, we could set up here with our six fives and probably still have a shot at something." Not that we would, but just the ability. 
to be able to look down 220 to 250 yards and potentially take a shot on a hog is yeah. kind of a fun thing. Yeah. So it was a cool spot to find. Uh, walked around a little bit. And again, I I should have had my Onyx open. I just got a new phone and I've been kind of struggling with it recently. <laughs> and yeah, the story about the new phone, I, again, probably. That's a whole other podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, my old one went for a swim, traded it for a catfish, but <laughs> we're not going to get too far into that. But um, yeah, I didn't have my Onyx or anything. So I was just like, yeah, it's somewhere over here. And so it was good to just kind of get some experience walking around and familiarize myself with it a little bit. But we walked around. Made it back to the truck. Well, and- actually, as we were walking back, we actually bumped something, if you remember. Oh, yeah. And it was funny because I made the comment. So, you know, I'm walking around with my AR and, you know, I'm kind of field ready with it. And it's amazing just the instincts when you're hunting, yeah. how quickly you react, right? So we're walking and, and, you know, we're talking about God knows what, as usual on these trips. And all of a sudden we hear something and immediately Pliny gets ready on his bow and my hand immediately goes down to my my safety guard and I'm ready to flip it open and start shooting. And I don't I still don't know what it was. I think it was probably a deer because it, it sounded long legged, if yeah. that makes sense. But we bumped it and we were both ready to ready to jump at it if if it was a pig. And I don't think long legged is a sound, but I know exactly what you mean. Like, <laughs> yeah. The way it ran off, the way we heard it stepping on because it's so rocky down there. You kinda yeah. nothing can sneak away without crumbling on some rocks. Right. So we heard something take off. We're like, I don't know, maybe it ran 20 yards and we can get on. If it's a pig, maybe we can get on it. So we just kind of circled downwind, try to hope to see it without it smelling us. Didn't happen. Yeah. We didn't see anything. But then we decided, which, you know, this was part of the goal of the trip. Let's let's go out and stretch out our rifles a little bit. Yeah. And we were already pretty much on the pipeline at that point. So we're like, hey, we'll just, instead of going back to camp, let's just do it from right here. So it was kind of cool. Um, just to give some context, uh, Plenty had mentioned we had gone out to my lease a couple of times, and I've got a 6.5 Creedmoor Ruger Precision, um, and the furthest I'd ever gotten it out to was on my lease. I just bought it. I bought it last year, but I hadn't shot it, um, and I got a True Glow Scope from yours truly, Mr. Plenty Gale, and uh, put that on it, 16X, and probably over the last two months, we've been out to my lease maybe two or three times. Mm-hmm. We got out to about 400 yards. I've got a lot of cows on my lease, which makes it a little difficult because they just love to go right in the way of where we're shooting. And so we had tried to get out to five and then maybe even 700 yards on my lease. We found a way to do it, but then it just kept raining and we didn't get there. So I was itching to get out and my goal was to get to about 700 yards. If I could get to 700 on it, I'd be pretty happy. Yeah. So we got out there. I think we very first set up at 200. Yep. We're like, let's just, you know, because we're going to try some other hunting stuff um, in the next little bit, let's just very first, before we get into too much long range stuff, just check our deer rifles. And we're both 270 fans. 270 win is just such a great cartridge. And I know that's a super cliche thing. And it's like the official deer rifle of America, if there was one. Um, so we just checked it. Daniel was right on the money at 200. Yeah. Perfect shot. Yeah. And with Savage Access 2, uh, Weaver 3 to 9, uh, <laughs> nothing fancy, but yeah. man, you get that and good ammo and you are set. And he smoked that target. Perfect center shot at 200. And that target was a 12 inch plate that we had spray painted orange. Yes. Yeah. So I tried it and I was way high. Yeah. And, um, and I, I don't know when I had bumped my scope. I have been messing around with an aftermarket trigger. Um, actually, and actually, I got in contact with that company, which is cool. Um, but yeah, it had some issues with an aftermarket trigger. So I, I had been kind of messing with my rifle a little bit. And it was way high. So we ended up closing into 100, got it zeroed, then backed up, confirmed everything. Then we pulled out the six fives and started going to town. So we yeah. shot three. Um, I don't think we messed around too much at three. We pretty much went straight back to four yep. and then five. Yep. We spent a little bit of time at five because you had only shot bef- uh, out the 400 before that. Yeah. So I think, um, so I, I changed my ammo from what we were doing before. And oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah so I, I was using the Hornady 147 ELD match grade stuff and I never shot that before. I shot it at a hundred yards at the range. So I actually did a test before we went out. Plenty had told me about this test he did. Where he got three or four different types of ammos, uh, ammo shot, 
groupings of three shots and saw which one was closest. And then he went with that. So I did the same thing and I took out a, a Hornaday 130 grain. I took out a Hornaday Hunter 140 grain and then this 147 match stuff. And I shot groups of three inches or, or three shots. And the first two that I shot, they were within an inch. And then what's crazy is with the Hornady match stuff, the 147 grain, took a shot at the range, took a second shot. And I was like, man, I think I missed the target, but it <laughs> didn't feel like I did. felt like it was a good shot. Took a third shot. And I realized my first bullet hole got bigger. And I realized what had happened. I put three bullets right on top of each other at 100 yards. One ragged hole. One ragged hole. So that was the ammo that obviously I decided matched best with my gun. Yeah. And so we took that out there. <clears throat> I never shot beyond 400 yards. At 500 yards, I think I threw two down range, hit them both. We backed up to 600 yards. For me, that was, again, another new record. I think I missed the first one. And then I hit the second one. And I think you hit the first one. You hit two or three. Mm-hmm. We backed up to 700. I think I missed the first one again or maybe the second one as well. And then I hit on the third. And <clears throat> actually, a quick aside, I had 37 rounds of ammo. And when we were driving out, we couldn't find any more. So I literally had 37 rounds and I was trying to get out to 1,000 yards with it. So then we backed up to 800 yards. Yeah, I forgot that. I mentioned I didn't mention that on the on the way down. We stopped by an academy, and we're like, "Yeah, do you have six five? Like, we don't have any ammo. Get yeah, out of here. <laughs> we're out. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Are you kidding me?" <laughs> so what's crazy is we got to eight hundred yards. We had a wind going, a little right to left wind uh, at the target. Now back where we were, it was almost a little left to right. It was swirling a little bit. Yeah, and plenty tells me before I took my first shot. And by the way, at this point, I'm laying on the ground, not in the truck bed, because I'm, I'm a relatively tall individual, so it was more comfortable. And he's like, hey, the further out we get, at about 800 yards, you really start feeling the wind effect. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I'll adjust for it, right? So I take my first shot at 800, and he's like, yeah, you missed to the right. Take my second shot. Ah, I think you missed to the left. And we've got a gravel pile behind us. So when you hit it, dust goes up. Right. Yeah. Very good splash. Yeah. It's a very good splash. And so I I was really struggling from 800 yards to find the wind. I think the up and down was right on, Mm -hmm. but the wind was just, it was just killing me. So about 12 shots in, hadn't hit the target yet. I looked at plenty. I said, I'm dying on this hill. And he said, I hope you mean, you know, figuratively, not literally. I said, no, no, no. But seriously, I'm going to waste whatever other ammo I well, have. Well, you were pretty serious and we were also on top of a hill. <laughs> we so. were on top of a hill <laughs> shooting at another hill. <laughs> so I was ready to die on it. And I think it was shot 14. I finally hit it. You were pretty excited. I was pretty excited. Uh, you know, Pliny gets up there and he hits it in his second shot, but whatever. I had done it before. I knew my dope. <laughs> and, and so I think this is a good opportunity to mention. Um, so Daniel had not shot this distance before. So how the hell did we know what to dial? Right. So I use Straylock. It's a ballistic calculator app, but I don't want to push it too hard or be too preachy about it because I think so many people trust these apps and it gets them into trouble. Or so many people just look at the numbers on the box of ammo and like, oh, it drops 18 inches at whatever. No, that's from the gun they tested it with, not your gun. Right. And what temperature was that? What was the wind like? What was the, you don't know any of that. So in stray lock, we put in the ballistics, but then make sure you adjust the temperature to the temperature that we're setting. Normally the factory setting on stray lock is 59 degrees Fahrenheit. I set it to 92 because that's what it was in South Texas when we were cooking. Actually, it was probably a little, it was probably like 90 when we were out there, but, um, so set that And then if you see a trend where you're like, oh, I tend to just be a few numbers high or a few, you know, a few clicks off, adjust the speed because, again, they're getting it from factory data from the ammunition manufacturer. Adjust the speed until it matches at a few different points and your try dope. That's what I've heard a few people call it. And I think it's a great term because it's it's dope that's, you know, it's not actually data on previous engagement, but it's good enough to try. It'll get you in the ballpark. And that way your try dope will be very, very close to what you've previously proven with your rifle at shorter ranges. So that's kind of how we knew where to dial um, getting Daniel out to 800. What we could not do with that 
is make good wind calls. Right. And that's the hardest part of long range shooting. Well, and the interesting thing is I think we actually got the dope pretty good. Yeah. Um, cause we were, we were on it now. Uh, Straylock had a really good kind of set of data for us to look at. Mm-hmm. And I ended up dialing, I think probably half an MOA on average higher once I got past 600 yards. Mm-hmm. Cause it was, it was a little off based on what I was doing with my rifle, but it was for the most part, it got me in the ballpark. Right. And then the windage was just, I was having a really tough time calling the wind. So I finally hit on 800 and I said to Pliny, I'm only taking one shot. I'm ready to move back to 900. I was happy with that. So strangely, 800 was the toughest thing from a shooting perspective I've done. We moved back to 900. I missed the first one. I hit the second one. Yeah. And it was, it was cool because it's like, okay. Well, and uh, you knew your wind hold. I knew my wind hold at that point. That, Absolutely. that was the difference. And, and I think what we figured out that you were doing – is I would call it based on what I was seeing, and I would see a puff of smoke or dust just left of the plate. And you were so close to the right edge of that, and we had a right-to-left wind, that I wasn't seeing any kick-up on the right side. The wind was just blowing it all behind the plate, and I was seeing it... Come out from the yeah, left edge. as it was coming out the other side. And so it, it's a good lesson for anybody who's listening to a spotter um, who's calling shots. If they're telling you... Barely left, barely right, barely left, barely right. You're probably not barely swinging 12 inches. Right. (laughs) You're probably having an issue with the visibility behind the target. Yep. Yeah. But once we got that, we backed it on up to 1,000. Back to 2,000, and I looked in my mag, and I said, Plenty, I got five rounds left to hit at 1,000 yards. Yep. And honestly, I was like, ugh. In the back of my head, I'm thinking, okay, if I don't get there with my rifle, uh, Plenty, do you have enough ammo with your rifle to allow me to at least take a shot and try to hit a 1,000 with your rifle? Which, obviously, no real shooter wants to do that with another person's rifle. It's kind of like sharing your toothbrush. It totally is. It's like, (laughs) hey, my toothbrush is dead. Can I borrow yours to brush my teeth tonight? So the cool thing is uh, we get out there. At this point, the drop rate, I couldn't lay on the ground anymore, if you remember, because I couldn't see the target. So I had to get in the back of the truck. It, it was it was basically flat, but there was there was a little downhill elevation. To explain that a little bit, because the ground was in your way, basically. The, we were on a slope on a hill, but it kept going up a little bit before it dropped off. Um, and at that point, we're shooting such an arc that you really need it to be straight or down. You can't have anything even remotely up. Or yeah. it'll be right in your way. And it was crazy. So at this point, you know, I start looking at the, the math behind it. And I'm looking at the number of MOAs that I'm dialing because my scope is an MOA scope. And then I'm doing... And the- I'm also in mills this whole time. <laughs> and so I realized I was trying to hold my tongue. And probably when I was talking about my shooting, you were probably like, yeah, whatever. I'm going to ignore what he's saying because yeah. he's saying it's in... I'm going to do an MOA. So yeah. that's cool, but that doesn't affect me. So I, we're dialing and I go, hey, Plenty, if I'm doing the math right on this, this is at 1,000 yards, almost a 24-foot drop. So I'm literally aiming 24 feet above the target. Yep. My bullet is going up 24 feet, dropping in and hitting a 12-inch plate. <laughs> Boom. Bing. So <laughs> I'm dealing with that. And, and I'm in the back of my head thinking, okay, now I'm in the back of Plenty's truck. I'm six foot four. My legs are crammed in there. I'm thinking I got five shots to try to hit 1,000. So I take my first shot. Oh, Before actually, that, I yeah. grabbed my camera because this I was like – call you know what? You've never done this before. Let's just set up the camera. You got five shots. This is, if you can hit it, this is a pretty cool story. And this is something that you're going to bust out like a party trick and show everybody on your phone. And I told plenty, I'm fine with that. But if I miss, you got to delete it. (laughs) (laughs) So just for the record, if you go to YouTube, it's on there. Yeah. (laughs) Spoiler. Spoiler. So the first shot, uh, I've missed either barely left or barely right. We still don't know. Uh, my second shot, and that was my fault as a spotter. Because no, I was it's just a like, thousand yards though. It's hard. Well, to I tell. know, but it, basically, what I'm saying is, you didn't wildly miss. Right, right. I, I failed to give you good, like exact, seeing exactly where it is. I feel like if it was a 15 inch plate on every single shot from 200 to a thousand, we wouldn't have missed anything. Yeah, well, we were and, close on everything. Admittedly, you're at 16x looking through a Chinese made scope, and it's a little smear. <laughs> yeah, and I'm at 20x looking at an American assembled scope, and it's a slightly bigger smear. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like at that distance, the mirage and the clarity of the lenses, and like it comes into effect. Yeah. 
So it, actually, that's a good point to pause before we get into the, the shooting side of it. So the mirage plays a part. And I didn't realize this. As a spotter, so, so Plenty and I were switching back and forth. I would shoot, he would spot, and he would, he would give me the call. He would say what the wind is. And then I would switch, and it was cool. Well, looking through the spotter scope, you can actually see the mirage. And especially at you know probably 600 plus, yeah. you can really see the wind movement on the mirage. You can see it. Now, again, it's not going to tell you it's going 10 miles an hour left to right. But you can see the mirage moving right to left and or you left can look right. at it to know hey it's increasing since your last shot correct okay now it's really increasing and it's cool too you can actually see the swirl yeah. so you can see okay 100 yards in front of me it's going left to right five to 600 yards in front of me it's going right to left yeah and i think some of that was because we, we were on a slope there are some little weird thermals in this depression yeah. but man people who really shoot long range uh, like that i mean there's so much of long range shooting that's that ultimately is just like basic science. It's just like taking simple physics and then making it big. But then being able to look at Mirage and get the feel for how much you can hold, that part of it is an art. Well, and what's funny is I don't know if any of you have seen that movie Shooter. We talked about that on the way out there. They bring up the the Coriolis effect, right? The curvature of the earth. And everyone you know that's never actually shot makes a big deal about this cool concept of, oh, when you shoot long distance, you got to think about the curvature of the earth. I've never shot that long, clearly. But what I'm more concerned about anytime I pull a rifle out shooting long distance is the Kentucky windage. What is, <laughs> yeah. what is the wind movement? Because that's going to impact my shot way more than any sort of curvature of the earth. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so we get out to 1,000 and we're, we're, we're spotting. First shot, I barely missed. Second shot, I think I clipped the edge of the plate because it moved a little bit in a weird way. But we, we couldn't tell. And so we're like, okay. No, at 1,000... This your second. That was when we were at nine hundred. Oh, okay. At a thousand, your first shot, I was like, no data. I have no idea mm. what happened. And then your second shot, I saw. I saw it clear as day. I'm like, left to right was perfect to keep that wind hold. Two clicks up. Right. Oh, that's right. Because again, we were using the data that we had on the app, and we we adjusted it. And my third shot, which by the way, two clicks up in MOA, is ten inches. Yeah, which, think about that, right? <laughs> I missed 10 inches with two little clicks, whereas at 100 yards, two clicks, you're not even going to see it. Like, it's maybe... It's a little bigger than the diameter of the bullet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so at 1,000 yards, that makes a big difference. On the third shot, nailed the plate. Perfect center shot. Just nailed it. It was funny. So I had my wife watch the video, and she watched it, and she thought it was cool. And for everyone out there, go check it out. But the coolest thing was, I took the shot, and I watched it again... And after I shoot, I'm not moving. I'm looking through the scope for about a second and a half, two seconds. And, and your people are probably watching it going, did he hit it or not? And then I jump up and I'm like, oh, I got it. I got it. Because it took a good second and a half to hit that It's plate. a 1.4 second flight time and then just over three to hear the sound. Yeah. So that was, <laughs> that was such a cool thing. So long story short, for me on this trip, goal number one accomplished yep and then i set up my rig i was like okay cool you're out of ammo move over (laughs) uh so i you know and i had been out there two weeks before and figured out my dope and i think i missed my first shot uh what was it second shot i don't remember i think you hit your third because we yeah we both hit it within our first three shots yeah yeah and then and i took six shots total and i hit it two out of six two out of six but I was really close on the others, and it was just minor wind yep. adjustments. That wind was tricky because it, it would stop for the most part, and then it would start again. It wasn't a massive wind, just enough to throw you off the side of the plate. Well, and for any other shooters out there, it wasn't full value. It was half value, meaning it was not going 90 degrees across. It was closer to 45, which actually influences the flight of the bullet less, but it's a lot harder to read, at least I think. Yeah. Um, because what you think you're seeing, sometimes you're not seeing the whole picture. Yeah. But anyway, we shot, we both got our rifles out to a thousand. So we're just under a kilometer with our factory rifles <laughs> <laughs> and man, it feels cool. Like it was really cool. A thousand used to be like the big deal that there were very few people who could do it and you were in the club and it's still, I mean, 
there are a lot more people who can do it now, but it was a big accomplishment for me. And for the record, it wasn't a thousand; it was about a thousand and three. So we're beyond. Oh yeah, yeah. So we're not in the club of thousand yard shooters. We're, we're in the club plus. of over a thousand yard shooters. Exactly. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And I was impressed with my little Sig rangefinder that I could range. Well, I guess you were doing all the ranging, but it could range out yeah. to a thousand out yeah. there. Because I've been in other places, especially looking through grass and stuff like that, where you really like can't you can't get a good lays on it. Um, so I've had to use like Onyx or mapping apps to figure out the distance. But that little rangefinder was a champ out there. Yeah, that was pretty cool. That was a you know we had we had tried to get out a couple hundred yards of my lease, and it was really cool to be able to get out to a thousand yards, take a shot. And be able to hit a 12 inch plate that for me thinking about that as an accomplishment is of a shooter is uh i know i can put a bullet into a magazine or into a rifle and touch something a thousand yards away that's pretty cool pretty cool yeah it's like the whole world just got that much smaller absolutely so <laughs> what did we do after that we went back to the camp and took a nap we're like yeah it's hot let's go eat sandwiches and sleep <laughs> So that was uh, that was that was the first accomplishment. That was on Saturday morning. Yep. I think it was about eleven o'clock when we finished up. Yeah. Maybe eleven thirty. Uh, we went back. Probably saw the black buck on the way back. If, if we're thinking about it, got back to camp. Uh, had some sandwiches. Took a nap because we were both like, man, we woke up early. And we went to bed late. And then uh, we decided. I think we 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 thought about. It, we're like, we're not going to go back out until about six o'clock. Yeah. To the to the the stand because. So just so everyone knows, it's about nine o'clock when sunset is, yeah. roughly. Yeah. So we're like, we're not going to go out there at four and just sit around for three hours and kind of waste time. Because I mean, we're close to summer solstice, the longest day of the year, and in a place with very bright sun and long days anyway. Yeah. But actually, I think the order was a little bit different. We went, ate lunch, chilled out for a little while. We actually did go back by the feeder fill it up and do some work. Oh, that's right. Uh, because basically that's that right. morning I saw, so I have a little, I have a very nice corn feeder and then a little rinky dink, one of those boss buck. Um, and I say rinky dink, it's their smallest model. They make bigger, nicer models, but I cheaped out, got the small one. Anyway, that's all me. Um, but the cows just like anytime, like I might as well just fill that thing with crack cocaine. The way they just like go crazy over that. Yeah. Smash through fences, knock it over. So I had been down there two weeks ago, and I came back, and the fence was crushed in two places, and the protein feeder was on its side and totally empty. So right. well, and actually, it was funny because that morning when we were watching the deer come in, I'm like, man, it doesn't even seem like they're jumping over the right side. They're just kind of walking into the feeder. How did she get in there? How did she get in there? Then she's walking out the other side. Yeah, we, that's when we saw that, you know, in, in that twilight, it was kind of hard to tell. But yeah. when we got up close, we're like, oh. Because some big heifer trampled it, <laughs> Went right through it, like the asshole that they are. <laughs> <laughs> so we got that all fixed, and and I really appreciate your help because working on like feeders and fencing and like especially when it's like ninety plus outside and constant Warm. like that that gets pretty brutal and mentally taxing on just like really I got to keep doing all this crap. So I really appreciate your help. Absolutely. And we got it knocked out in less than an hour. I mean, that was pretty yeah. quick that we got through yeah. it. So that was good. Got that filled up. Um put 50 pounds of protein in there that's probably already gone by the time we're oh, recording yeah. this. Absolutely. Probably some raccoons just like got his face in it like, "Thank you." <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, we did that. We're like, it's hot. So we went back to the cabin, took a nap, came back out at six. We were sitting there. So this is the this is actually uh, outside of my three goals I accomplished. Probably one of my favorite parts of this story. Yeah. So we can break this down into like your goals and then your other high points. Yeah, so. exactly. So this is outside of the goals. Uh, so again, my goals, shoot at a thousand yards, hopefully see and kill a pig, hopefully see and kill an axis buck. So... We get out there. Uh, when we were out earlier doing some work, Pliny had changed the settings from, I think, 6 o'clock feed time to 7 o'clock feed time. Yeah. And so we're sitting there. You know, we got there at like 6, 6.15. We're shooting shooting the breeze. And all of a sudden, like we didn't even realize that, I don't think, 7 o'clock goes off, right? And the feeder goes off. Yeah. And suddenly... Like literally within 10 seconds, if you look 300 yards out, the feeder's 100 yards out exactly. You look 300 yards out, I see this little doe just booking it 
I have never seen a happier deer in <laughs> my time. life. Meal time. Tail wagon. Oh my gosh. <laughs> she like if you could think oh of a boy. dog Corn with their again. tongue out running at you. <laughs> and so of course, uh, Pliny's telling me a story, and he's not looking. And I kind of like I'm not looking because I'm watching the deer. I didn't know what it was at first. Right, it's just an animal running at me. And I kind of like rub my hand on Pliny's leg, like, "Hey, man, look!" And Pliny jumps out of his seat because I did it in a way that wasn't like a, n- a natural like tap. It was like a, "Hey, I'm going to tickle your leg." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were like, I don't know if you were looking through binos or what, but you reached over and yeah, it wasn't just like a, "Hey." It was just like this weird, like, <laughs> and, you know, we're in South Texas. So I'm like, what is that bird tarantula? I don't know. So I, I about jump out of my skin. <laughs> but then we both see the, we both see the doe coming down and we're just like, man, she is excited. Yeah. She can't wait to get to that feed. And we realized she probably came down to six when the feeder was going off. Nothing went off. Was disappointed. Disappointed. <laughs> went and bedded down a couple hundred yards away. When it went off, she's like, here we go. <laughs> I'm meal first. Time. I'm first. So she ends up running down. And we think it's this little scrawny doe that we watched in December who just lives right there. Yeah. And is just like, she's always by herself and just like, that's the highlight of every day. <laughs> she, she is, you know, if you classify an animal that's wild, she's a sweet little animal, sweet little doe. Um, and she, she literally has no friends in the world. <laughs> <laughs> she, she just all she cares about is sleeping and eating whatever Pliny is putting out in the feeder. <laughs> yeah. So she comes down. We had thrown some corn outside of the fence area. She's kind of chomping away at it. Oh, and to clarify for anybody who's not used to hunting in Texas, it's not deer season. We can't shoot these whitetail, but pigs are just like a consolation prize that sometimes you just run into them. Sometimes you can hunt your tail off and you'll never find them. But sometimes you just happen to run into them. So we are primarily like, yeah, if we put a bunch of bait out there, that's the number one way to be successful on pigs. So that's what we were out there sitting for. But and we were we were hoping that potentially we see an axis. Yeah. Very, very low rate of, of uh, thinking that we would get one. Uh, but the, the primary thing was, hey, see if we can see a pig. Yep. So we're sitting there. And I still, to this day, I have no idea what we were talking about. We were talking about God knows what. And just to set it up. So we're in – how big do you think your, your blind is? Probably uh, – It's exactly four by six. Four by six. Because <laughs> I built that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's four by six. I'm on the left side of the blind. Plenty's on the right. And we're talking. And on the left side, there's, there's a two by four that runs up on the, the left plane of view for me. And I guess for both of us. And so we're sitting there and Plenty is looking at the little doe. The little doe is still there. She was eating for probably an hour. She was just sitting there. And I'll let you tell this part of the story because this is the best part. Yeah. Well, so she had just been sitting there just like nose deep in corn for a long time. Like the rest of the world did not exist and she couldn't get enough. And then all of a sudden she popped her head up and just kind of had that weird like squinty, twitchy look on her face. And then just like kept staring, but not quite at us. So I was like, oh, were we too loud? Because admittedly, we weren't being deer season quiet. <laughs> not at all. I mean, we were not trying to be especially loud, but we weren't being as quiet as we could. It's like, oh, were we too loud? I'm like, oh, she's kind of looking like past us and to the left. And so I was like, oh, maybe there's more deer coming out. So I looked over there to try to see, like, what the heck is she looking at? And I'm looking and looking. And then I see a little dark spot. And, of course, instead of just being like, Subtly announcing it to Daniel, I say, pig, 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 pig. Keep in mind, we're in the middle of like a, a deep philosophical conversation, and I'm getting yelled at, pig, 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 pig. And I'm like, oh my God, where? That's the whole reason we're here. And the pig was like right where that two by four was, plain of view. And so it's like, we couldn't see it at first, and then it stepped out. And so uh, Pliny had his camera out, and yep. our, our goal was to hopefully get this on video. So I pop up, and th- the one thing about the way that I hunt, we talked about this a lot, is when I get an animal in my sights that I'm going to shoot, I take the shot immediately. Yeah. And so I put my gun on the on – the, on the, there's like a little uh, kind of rest area where the opening for the window is for the deer stand. I put my gun on there, and I remember getting the pig. He's kind of just sauntering along, trotting into the feeder. I get my, my, my sight on him. He's probably 60 yards out. And I'm, I'm on him, and I say, Plenty, are you recording? And I hear, yes. And as soon as he says yes, boom, took the shot. And it, was, and it was so funny because after this, 
I'll tell you how the, the pig dropped. Plenty goes, dude, as soon as I said yes, I kind of slowly put one of my fingers in my <laughs> ear so it didn't, it didn't blow my eardrums and, out. And I can't act it out for all you podcast listeners, but I probably just like looked like the goofiest guy ever. <laughs> one hand on my camera, I guess in case I needed to turn it or something, and the other hand just like straight finger out, slow motion right in the ear. <laughs> <laughs> so I take the shot, and the pig just drops. Yeah. And it like he didn't even he just kind of crumpled down. Just sit down. Just sat right down. And so we're like I was pumped. I was super fired up because I haven't shot a pig in a while. And it was just I mean the whole span of when you said pig to when I shot him was probably maybe maybe 8 to 10 seconds. Like just it quick. was it was really quick. And so he ends up going down and we're like okay, let's sit around and see if uh see if something else comes in. So keep in mind this is probably I don't know, close to seven thirty, eight o'clock, somewhere around there. Yeah, probably seven thirty. I think it was. Yeah, because uh, yeah. So so he's sitting there. No, it was later than that. It was probably eight. It was. Wasn't it? it was about eight. Yeah. So the sun's still out. Yeah. So of course, you know, I'm sitting there going, "Man, it's ninety, ninety five degrees out, and uh, there's a pig that I just shot. He's dead now. He twitched a little bit, but he was dead. And I'm like, man, the sun is just beaming down on him. So of course, I I leaned to to plenty i said hey uh do you think we should go get him he's like well what do you mean i go well you know he's he's baking in the sun <laughs> and i said that i was like <laughs> bacon in the sun <laughs> and i didn't even mean that as like hey it's bacon in the sun i basically meant hey he's baking in the sun <laughs> i think that's the name of this episode just bacon, bacon in, in the, the sun, sun. <laughs> But, oh man! <laughs> and we just like we're laughing like little schoolgirls at this <laughs> stupid like dad joke. I oh guess. my gosh, it was hilarious though. And we're like, yeah, let's give it to like eight thirty because at that like something may come out because right now it's still kind of that starting to get dark kind of twilighty feel to it. So maybe something else will come out. But if anything after that, let's get on this thing and get clean. And it. it's late enough. So yeah. sat out there, didn't see anything else. Went down and got it, and man, here's the craziest thing. So we rolled up on it with the and, and Plenty's recording it. And first of all, I'm going to say this on your podcast. I hope it's all right. We rolled up. This thing had the biggest nuts I've ever seen, <laughs> like oranges, <laughs> <laughs> like oranges. Because we were sitting there going, "All right." So he was alone, and we thought we we thought it was a he. Could have been a sow, but we thought it was a boar. Just because it wasn't with a group, wasn't like with you a group. Always, yeah, come sauntering in. Uh, he was he, he looked big bodied. He looked like he was probably ninety a hundred pounds. Yeah. So we we roll up on it. He's got like oranges, and we're like, <laughs> okay, yeah, that's definitely a boar. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at him like, hey, Plenty, what the hell's wrong with his eye? Yeah. And what's coming out of his mouth? That was weird. And it then we weird. looked over him and we're like, and that exit wound, it's and like all over dark. his nuts. Yeah. And we realized ants, like, not like a couple ants, like you see in deer season, like, oh, look, there's a couple ants on it. But yeah, literally thousands of ants were all over this thing within minutes. Within So we were probably, we probably shot them, and then 20, 25 minutes later, we went down. Yeah. And uh, I kind of pushed them a little bit, and ants came flooding out of his mouth. And it's funny, I didn't tell you this. I sent the picture to a buddy of mine, he goes, did you shoot him in the eye? I said, no, I didn't shoot him oh, in the eye. Oh, he was like, what's up with the eye? The eye just had a, bu- it probably had 200 ants on it. Yeah. So we ended up taking a couple of pictures. Um, you know, I shot him right through the neck, which is why he dropped immediately, which uh, for me. Fantastic shot. Yeah. So Great I, shooting. I, I had never taken a shot on an animal that was trot. He wasn't trotting too fast, but he was moving a little bit. Yeah. And usually I wait until they Give me an angle that I want to take a shot. On this one, I was like, look, it's a pig. I'm going to take the shot. I'm not going to waste it. Yep. So I took the shot, and I was very satisfied with the shot I took because I shot him right in the neck, dropped him. So we end up loading him up. We put gloves on. Plenty gave me these uh, gloves that were made for, uh, for well, a Well, I bought them from Harbor Freight, so they're made for like a Chinese infant. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> so we, we end up putting them in the truck. We had picked them up and dropped them just to get the ants off. And so I remember saying... We thought he was – actually, so he got bigger on the ground as we Yeah, moved normally there's like the phenomenon of ground shrinkers where, shrinkage where you're like, yeah, it was like a you know 130-inch nice buck. And you walk up and you're like, 
I've never seen that book before. <laughs> yeah. yeah, is that thing legal? <laughs> so but anyway, we're this like... This one was ground, a ground grower, for yeah, sure. Yeah, we were like, he's probably 100, and we got there, we're like, man, this guy's heavy. Yeah. So we ended up loading him in the truck, and I said to Pliny, I said, hey, man, are we sure we don't need to put the tailgate up? Pliny's like, no, oh, dude, I shot one last week, he was about 100, he's going to be fine. So we start driving back to the driving back to the and as we're driving back, um, Kyle's probably listening to this, but I was telling this story. I was like, "Yeah, my buddy Kyle shot two deer one time, and I watched him (laughs) drop one out of the back, and I just picked it up for him." And ha ha, how silly that was! (laughs) So we get back, and there's a gate to get into the actual cabin, right? And so the whole time, because we had made a kind of a deal of this, right? So the whole time, I'm thinking in the back of my head, when we pull out, I'm going to go get the get the gate, but I'm going to tell Plenty, dude, you dropped the pig out of the back. And so I open my door, I get out, and I look back, and sure enough, the pig's not in the back of the truck. And I'm like, Plenty, I was going to make a joke about this, but literally the pig's not in the back of the truck. And I'm like, oh, no. There's about two miles of rocky terrain (laughs) that we've come across. But the good thing is we went back maybe 300 yards yeah, somehow and he fell out he fell on, right on the, the really smooth, flat part. And, the, and actually, the really good thing is that knocked the rest of the ants off of yeah. him. <laughs> yeah, like perfectly. Like there were none left. Like you might as well like put them in a paint shaker and fling them <laughs> off because I didn't see any. There was nothing left. So we ended up picking them up. We go back. We went back to camp. Uh, Plenty had actually some, some boar sausage that we ended up smoking. We cut the pig up. Uh, we took the quarters off of him, took the back straps. And for, for all intents and purposes, for me... Goal number two was accomplished. A shot of pig, and we made a bet. So I now am a proud owner of something that I'll tell you about in a moment. Yeah. We made a bet on— Well, you know, and you weren't used to like this, the idea of betting on the weight in deer camp. Yep. And maybe some people don't do this, but my introduction to deer hunting was in southwest Mississippi, and that's just what you do. And the deer down there aren't real big, <laughs> but it's what you do. When everybody's sitting there with a beer in your hand, just hanging out, somebody— Pops in, doesn't matter if it's the greatest buck ever or the tiniest doe. Everybody takes out a pen, writes on their hand what they think it weighs, hoists that thing up, puts a dollar in the pot, and then the winner takes all. So we didn't have any pens on us. So we said, hey, there's no cell phone service, but we'll text each other anyway what we think the weight is. Yeah. And I'd introduced plenty to a concept called the signed dollar. I didn't know about this. So this is a fun bet, right? It's, it's a gentleman's bet with a little bit of skin in the game. So essentially what it is, is whatever that bet is, you're signing a dollar if you lose for whatever the bet is, and you sign your name and you give it to the other person. So it's kind of a momentum uh, keepsake, if you will, that says, hey, I lost a bet to you. There's no real money involved. It's a $1 bill that you're never going to spend. But you've got this cool novelty thing forever. You've got a novelty. So I think, uh, if I remember correctly, I put on my weight on the board, 140 pounds. And I was like, man, I might be overshooting it. But he seemed pretty heavy. And I was like, Daniel's probably going to guess high. So I guess 131. And sure enough, he was 148 pounds. Yeah, we were both low. That thing was a tank. He was a big boy. He was a big boy. So we ended up cleaning him up. I got a a nice signed dollar bill from Pliny that said, congrats on the boar. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, yeah, we cooked some sausage, drank some beer, and uh, called it a night. Yeah. And it, you know, we kind of, it took us a while to get that thing cleaned out, but all four quarters without gutting it, um, got both the full loins, really nice, clean meat, good cuts. Um, so I had never cleaned a pig before. And so Pliny was kind of showing me the ropes of, all right, here's, so I've cleaned deer before. Uh, Pliny's helped me kind of show me the ropes on that. And I was looking at it going, okay, very similar. Yeah. Anatomically, it's the same. Just getting through that hide. But you, yeah, on like on the shoulder between the skin and the gristle, it is at least an inch thick. When I remember at one point you said, punch right here and see how tough this is. And I'm like, ah, that, that's kind of corny. And I punched and I'm like, man, this thing is like, this yeah. is a thick hide. Especially on a boar, right on the shoulder. People will talk about the shield and mostly like bow hunters who are shooting like really crappy mechanicals who get no penetration. They're like, oh yeah, the shield. And But it really is thick. Yeah. And yeah, so that, that took us a while to get through that, but Got it all done. Got it on ice that night. And I'm a firm believer in just get it on ice quick. Some people let animals hang out there way too long. um, And it's basically within a couple – you kill the animal. Within a few hours later, rigor mortis sets in. At that point, the meat's going to be really, really tough. You want to get it on ice before that 
or get it in a cooler and let it sit for like a day. Like when I say cooler, I mean like a walk-in or if you're up north um, and it's cold enough, let it hang. But our goal was just get it taken apart before rigor set in, get it on ice. And we're fortunate to have an ice maker. Now it's just well water, so it's not the tastiest ice, but it's ice and it's clean. And so we got the pig on ice that night immediately cooling down. Yeah, so that was that was really cool. Again, goal number two accomplished, and, and we ended up eating some dinner and then calling it a night. And we said, all right, let's wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning. And we actually changed our strategy. So we were going to go out to the pipeline where there's these like yellow flowers that we always see the deer eating. And we thought, okay, let's just go out, sit on the pipeline. We were shooting at 1,000 yards, just do a bunch of glassing first thing in the morning and, and see if we can see – Maybe an axis comes in. Maybe another pig comes in and we pop him. Yep. Yeah, and just especially since we on that very pipeline, we're now feeling pretty ballsy and confident out to a thousand yards. <laughs> like, yeah, that'll be a cool opportunity yeah. to see something. Take a pig from six hundred. <laughs> yeah. Then after getting to bed at about midnight after a very long, very day, long day, we got some sleep. I didn't sleep great the first night. I slept horribly. That night I slept quite a bit better, but still not great. My alarm went off at five, and I was just like, uh-uh. "We both looked at each other. And we're like, are we sure we want to do this?'" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, especially since we had more planned for that day, and I feel like I'm not really the guy to be like, "Nah, I'm on this hunt, but I'm going to sleep in." Like that's not me. Normally, I'll be like, "Yeah, I'll I'll be really tired later, but it's worth it." And I think we were kind of looking at it, going, "All right." Uh, so, so our plan was to go to another ranch and go do access hunting. So we had to clear out of camp by about 9 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And so I think our thought was, okay, if we go out and we hunt, there's a possibility, albeit slim, that we see an axis. And if we see that, fantastic outcome. But if not, if we see a pig, we actually have a decision to make. Yeah. Do we want to shoot it and clean it because that might take an hour or two and – we realize if we don't shoot it before about 6.30 or 7. We might blow our logistics for everything else. Exactly. Yeah. So we ended up saying, okay, you know what? The, the likelihood of us getting an animal we really care about is slim to none. And, and plenty shot plenty of pigs. Uh, I was really excited that the day before I had shot a pig. So we kind of both nodded and said, you know what? We're probably not going to see an axis. And I don't know that we actually want to shoot another pig this morning. Yeah. So we slept in till about 7.00. Yeah, I think it was about seven. Yeah. Um, got up, had a banana, had a cliff bar. Um, I think we were lacking for good coffee that morning. So oh, we're, we're kind of moving a little bit in slow motion. Yeah. And it's just like, to me, like, until coffee's happened, the day hasn't actually started yet. Nothing going on yet. <laughs> so our agreement was the first gas station we find on the way back, coffee time. Yeah. So we and, end up packing up, getting the truck. Uh, shut off the power, the water, everything like that. And all that always takes longer than you think yeah. out there when it's a well. And yeah. So we head out and we were heading to what's the name of the town? I kept, I saw it. I kept thinking it was Backstrap. But it's not. <laughs> it's an appropriate name, but it was Bastrop. Bastrop. Or so, as the millennials call it, Bass Drop. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about that bass, no trouble. <laughs> so we end up heading out to, to Bastrop. And that's uh, about what? Three and a half, four hours out? Yeah. So we, we get in the truck. Well, it's supposed to be three, but then I... <laughs> I wasn't going to say <laughs> made it four. about that. <laughs> so we got coffee. That's the important thing. We ended up driving past it. So setting up the logistics, you probably tell the story better. Um, so Pliny and I have been talking about doing an access hunt for a while. And he had, he had found a couple and we were kind of talking about them. They just didn't make a lot of sense from a price perspective and what it was. And so we ended up finding one. It was kind of on our way back, a little bit off track, but kind of on our way back up to Dallas. And he's like, hey, do you want to do this? I said, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to go get an Axis buck because I want a good mount. I want some good meat. Um, and so so Plenty set this up. Yeah, and so I had just been kind of looking around, trying to find a reasonable deal on on a, a good hunt for an Axis buck where we've actually got like a pretty darn good chance of getting something, but it's through an outfitter who seems reputable. And then, so Daniel was really wanting a buck. And for me, it kind of wasn't in the budget um, right now. And so I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll pay to shoot a doe 
and I'm really wanting to test out this broadhead and you know it's been a while since I've shot my bow at an animal so I'm kind of itching to do that so I'm like I, I told the guy I'm like and I'll I'm likely interested in a doe I'm not sure yet but I'll, I'll, I'll see when I get there but I'm likely interested in a doe so we found a guy in this area who could do it super nice dude um, and I've had some bad experiences with outfitters too. I don't know if the state of Texas licenses guides and outfitters. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. I know some Western states are really stringent about that, but there are some people in Texas who do that kind of thing and they are the most genuine, hardest working people I've met. And then there are some people who are downright sleazy and it's a mix. So I found this guy seemed like a nice guy. Um, good rate that we were excited about. Um, so we made it down there and kind of as we were going, he basically said, okay, there's a couple different properties that he guides hunts on. Um, basically the biggest is 500 and the smallest is 50, whatever, which seemed really small to me. I mean, that's a huge range, 500 acres to 50 acres. Um, he's like, it ultimately gets to like the animal, the type of animal that you're looking for, where I'm seeing them that day. That's the place we go. So we ended up rolling up, and it was funny because uh, Pliny and I the whole time are kind of making jokes like, are we going to roll up on a petting zoo and take a shot, right? And so we end up rolling up, and sure enough, it's the 50-acre plot. And we meet the guy, really nice guy, and we get back in the truck, and Pliny's like, hey, do you want to do this? And my thought was, we've already kind of gone four hours today. For uh, this, yeah. For this. Uh, this guy's probably driven an hour and a half because he wasn't near there. And my thought is, look, we're already pregnant with it, right? <laughs> um, it's, it's not, it was not the most challenging situation for a hunt. And, and uh, I think Pliny and I both agree on this. Um, we like to be challenged when it comes to a hunt, right? I, I want to kind of go out and, and work for getting an animal. And that was not this hunt. But we said, okay, let, let's see what we can do with it, right? So we end up going in, and it's an exotic ranch. There's other animals in there. And uh, so the guide basically told us, he said, hey, I'll take one of you in the in the buggy, uh, the rifle shooter that's going for the buck, which is me. And then Pliny was going to go sit in a, in a, in a little blind for, um, for with his bow for a doe. So we end up going. We get all ready. And, you know, I, I'm starting to think in the back of my head, like, you know what? I'm going to make the best of this scenario. I really, really want to axe this buck, right? Yeah. Not necessarily the ideal situation in which I want to take an axis buck, but I would love to get one. And I really want, I'm out of deer meat, so I really want some meat in my cooler. Yeah. Right? And, Man, it was, and for anybody out there, if you have not had axis meat, it is so, so good. In fact, we just ate the back straps. Today. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so that tells you what the outcome was. One thank you. Yeah. A little bit of a spoiler, <laughs> but thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Bowl. So, so we, we, uh, we end up getting all ready and, you know, I'm like, look, I'm all in, right? Uh, again, not the ideal hunting situation, but I'm looking at it going, you know what? I'm going to make the best of the situation. Uh, I, I want to, I want a buck. I want the meat. So we end up going out and, and it was interesting. It's not a huge plot of land. Um, but what's interesting is there's a little herd running around and the guy starts telling me, he goes, yeah, it's probably going to take us about an hour or two to be able to get on one. I said, well, what do you mean they're all right there? He goes, yeah, well, they're moving around. And what you'll realize is it's really hard to get a shot on one because they're kind of huddled together. They're skitsy too. They're, like they're axis skitsy are really jumpy. Out, and so they don't sit still long enough. And so in my mind, and I think I alluded to this earlier, my thought when it comes to hunting, I trust my shot maybe to a, to a detriment. I don't know. We'll find out later. But I trust my shot. And if I get a shot on something, I'm a quick trigger puller. I'll take the shot you got, not the one you want. Exactly. I will take the shot I got. So we end up rolling up. You know, we see him run off. And I get out. I'm standing. I'm leaning up against a tree. I've got eyes on. So, so and it, we, there's three shooter bucks in this group. And one of them was clearly the alpha in the group, right? He's pushing the other ones around. Um, he's he's much bigger body than the others. Um and so I'm like, that, that's the one that I want because he's a, he's a good-looking buck, uh, got a lot of meat on him. So I end up looking at him. I look, I'm looking at him through my scope, and there's a, little, there's a little doe behind him. And I'm like, man, on my first attempt, at it, I'm like, I'm not going to take that shot because you know I trust myself, but at the same time, I don't want to clip another animal. 
It's so a we, good call. They end up running off. They group up. You know, we kind of follow them again. We're going down, and they're they're kind of grouped up. There's probably 15 or so of them, and they end up splitting up. And all of a sudden, this big buck who's put he was always in the back pushing them. Uh, he ends up in the middle of of the herd, and kind of like you know, when the Red Seas part, which is strange to say that, but they 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 both both sides kind of parted around him. And he starts tr- trotting from the right herd to the left herd. And he's kind of walking at an angle where there's no shot on him. And the guide's like, yeah, you know, we'll probably have to circle back around. He turned for literally half a second. I took a shot. Nice. And the guide's like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, man. And we were probably there. I don't he know. didn't even know you were going to shoot. He didn't know I was going to shoot. He was using your binoculars. He was using my binos because he <laughs> forgot his. And like I said, as soon as I see the shot, I'm going to take it, right? Yeah. So I, I put a shot on him, and he walks. And so I've, I've shot a number of whitetail, and I'm like, man, usually they kind of you know do the mule kick or whatever. Like all or nothing. Like all they or either nothing. drop or they're just like, yeah, yeah get that out of hurt. here. <laughs> yeah. And he just kind of walks over. And I'm like, man, I feel like I put a pretty good shot on him, and a 270 round is going to put an animal like that down. And the guy's looking through my bino still. Yeah, <laughs> He's like, no, no, I can see a blood spot. You definitely hit him. So he walks about 10, 15 yards over this tree, and then he just collapses. Like nice. It wasn't one of those deals where he kind of laid down because he was in pain. He just like fell down. So he, he was just dead standing there. He was and dead then it standing was just there. Like, it took a second to catch up with him. Absolutely. And, then, yeah. and so the cool thing about this, again, you know, uh, Plenty and I were talking about this before. Never a hunt that I'd done before on kind of a guided, you know, uh, outfitted kind of exotic hunt. I've always wanted to do one just to kind of see what it's like. You can never knock something until you do it, right? Yeah. Not the ideal hunt, but what I loved about it, it was the ideal shot. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really liked. I didn't have to go out, sit in a deer stand for, you know, four hours to find the right deer. But the fun thing was my shot and, and how that came to pass and waiting for that shot and then as soon as I saw it, knowing with the confidence that my rifle's going to put a, a bead on that thing. You didn't mess around. Didn't mess you around. You do exactly what you need, needed to do, and yeah. you knew exactly where it was going to go. And and I think this guy's guided a lot of new hunters. And so seeing somebody who knew exactly where to put it, and even in a n- very narrow gap of time, you knew exactly how to time it. Yeah. I think he was impressed by that. He, he was actually he, – he told me, he goes, man – that was the quickest someone's shot an animal on this lease. He wow. goes, typically, it's actually more challenging on this property than on my 500 acre property because of the fact that they're herded together. You know, you've got to wait for that perfect shot. And so he was like, that, that was way faster than I thought it would be. And man, that's a testament to like how far you've come as a hunter and as a rifleman. So totally. it was basically. I was going to say two years, but not even like a year and a half ago, I saw you shoot your first buck yep. and you were excited. You were nervous as hell. Yeah. You're like, what well, should I shoot it? Should I not? <laughs> yeah. And you made a great shot when it came down to it. You made a perfect shot on that buck. But now seeing you like grow as, as a rifleman, as a hunter, knowing what to do, seeing you ping a plate at a thousand yards seeing you take your first test shot with your 270 on our little warm-up experiment and just drill it at 200 and then timing that, yeah, it wasn't like the wildest adventure of a hunt. It wasn't hiking 20 miles right. into backcountry. And like that part, we pretty much knew we were going to get on them, and you did. But in terms of like shot placement and shot timing and seeing the deer that you wanted and just getting it done, you swung for the fences and made it work. And it was good. It was, it was, uh, so <clears throat> the, the coolest thing about this was shot the buck. He went down, we went and got him. Uh, if I could picture going into the weekend, the buck that I wanted to shoot, that was him. And that was the coolest thing to me. He was, he was just probably just under 200 pounds. He's a big body buck. So I got a lot of meat out of him, but th- he had probably 10 inch brow tines yeah, which awesome is brows. Really, what I wanted. So, so uh, for those of you that don't know, with Axis deer, um, they can get pretty high. They don't get massively wide. They can, but um, I didn't want one that was really wide or really high. I wanted one that was symmetrical, relatively high. I think he was about 24, 25 inches high. But I wanted those brow tines because that is like 
for me, when I look at an axis, I'm like, man, that's cool as hell. Yeah. And so this guy had those dark red, just really nice, mature brow tines, really nice rack on it. And then his coat was just beautiful. It was the perfect specimen of like an axis deer in summer. Like orangey red, really dark stripe, really bright white spots. And something that I think is cool about axis, and maybe it's just a summer thing because I've never petted a whitetail in the summer, <laughs> um, but it, it's not hair, it's fur. Like yeah. they're soft. It's yeah. like you're petting a dog or something. It was, it was a little weird because I feel like I shot a pet dog. But... <laughs> <laughs> they're no, soft. It was, it was really cool. So Beautiful we ended up, animal. Yeah. So we ended up uh, skinning them out. Uh, we're going to do a pedestal mount with them. Take a couple months to get that back. Got the meat off of them. Uh, and then we ended up heading, actually, funny enough, we headed to an academy because the guide uh, was kind enough to take the the head. We're about four hours outside of Dallas, three and a half hours. Uh, so he was going to take the rack for us to a taxidermist he knows in Waco. He ended up taking the deer from us. We went and got a bigger cooler to put it in. Because, it, yeah, it, it, it just, just barely didn't fit in my Arctic or your Yeti. Yeah. So we got like a cheap cheap little uh, igloo, but ginormous. And it's gin- actually the nail- same yeah. one that I got to fly with for yeah. my elk hunt. I look back in my garage. Oh, and was like, it? It was the exact same <laughs> nice. cooler. So we got all that done. And that was where, so for me, great weekend, right? Three goals, hit a thousand, kill a pig, kill an axis, accomplish all three goals. Had a couple of cool things where we saw an axis early on, saw a doe with her fawn, saw a jackrabbit that we thought was a doe. <laughs> right? <laughs> a couple of cool things that were in there. Learned a ton. I always like hanging out with Pliny because I learn more about hunting when I hang out with him. Uh, I learned about you know carving up a, a pig, which was really cool. And I feel confident the next time I probably won't get it perfectly by myself, but I can do it. And that's what, I, that's yeah. what I'm always looking forward yeah. to. So we end up heading back. And it's probably 4 o'clock and Pliny and I are both like, man, we're kind of hungry. And so we're like, man, I really want some Mexican food and like a margarita. Because that's what you do in Texas. And that's how, you know, when we kind of introduced Daniel to dove hunting, we're like, so kind of what you do, like after you clean the birds, is you go get a margarita. Like that's kind of part of it, <laughs> it's right? It's part of it. Yeah. That's... So, so we, it, where we always got the margarita was a taco cabana. Yeah. So for those of you that aren't on planet Earth right now, there's this little thing called COVID-19 going on, <laughs> the corona. And it's impacting a lot of things. Clearly it was impacting the uh cabana and i think it was was it temple that we stopped yeah we weren't awake yeah i think it was temple so we end up pulling over off the highway we uh we see a taco cabana and we're like all right let's go inside we'll get some you know fajitas and we'll get a margarita so we walk inside and this woman who's cleaning uh immediately stops and goes hey uh gentlemen you have to have a mask on to come in here and we're like well how the hell are you supposed to eat your food with a mask on? You ever eat a chalupa with your mouth covered? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we go, so we're, we're kind of in shock. Like, I don't really know what to do right now. So I'll just stand here <laughs> like, like a doe when a light flashes in their <laughs> yeah. eyes. They're, they're probably looking at us like those dummies. <laughs> yeah. So then this woman who's behind the counter, kind of like in an angry tone. Kind of. Like yeah, yells at She us. was downright snippy. She's like, you got to get out of here unless you got a mask on. And at that point, I was so wishing that I had like a luchador mask <laughs> in my truck. And I could come back and be like, I want tacos. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, end up, we end up going, we didn't say anything because we're both respectable gentlemen that were not quick enough on our feet. <laughs> yeah. And so we're just like, uh. Okay. Okay. Bye. Uh, we'll go somewhere <laughs> else, I guess. But we're so we we decide that we still want Mexican and margaritas. Yeah. So we we start driving off, and the whole time, the twenty five thirty minutes to the next Mexican food restaurant, we're talking about how we should have just swiped a tortilla, and put it on our face, and said, "This is our mask." Beat the Rona with a tortilla. <laughs> start chewing through it when they say, "Hey." We can see your face. Grab another tortilla. And say, I need another mask. <laughs> this time, can I get some beef in my tortilla mask? <laughs> so we end up going to another Mexican place. Had a real actually, it was a really good meal. Hole in the wall place in like a old strip mall looking thing. It was fantastic. Really good. And I think it was just like a tiny owned family family owned kind of thing. Yeah, really good food. Good margaritas. Yeah, got those. Got on the road. Headed back. Got back. Uh, Plenty was kind enough to let me borrow his cooler. 
because I didn't want to mix, you know, the pig and the the deer meat because they were both pretty big bodied. Yeah. And uh, so now I've got. Say, two, I don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> got two coolers out back, and uh, yeah, that's that's kind of the trip. Yeah, and we're big fans of keeping everything on ice for a couple of days just to let all the blood kind of drain out of the meat. And I know there's a lot of people up north who think this is like the weirdest thing ever. Like, and and I call it wet aging. It's not true wet aging where you like carve everything up and then back seal it and then age it. Basically, it's just letting the meat totally relax on ice before you freeze it. And with red meat, man, you can do that for over a week easily. I, I think 10 days is about the sweet spot from what I've found. If you need to go longer, you can. It doesn't get any better after 10 days. Um, but with Axis, the meat's so good, it probably doesn't need that much. But probably a couple of days is great just to let any lactic acid, um, especially for an animal that's been running around a lot, um, just let all the blood drain out of the meat. And then a pig doesn't need that much either, probably just a couple of days. But let it drain out, have nice, clean, healthy meat. Yeah, so it was kind of cool because uh, Plenty had shot that pig a couple of weeks ago, and he told me uh, th- there's a place that we go to called Kubi's, yep. and they make just fantastic sausage. If you're in Dallas area at all, there. like I'm sure there are other great places, and I'd love to know about them, but it's just kind of the Kubi's is a restaurant. Um, I think they're on Mockingbird, yeah. kind of like uptown area. And, and it's like a family owned like German restaurant that serves authentic German sausage. But then kind of down by the river in this warehouse district. Down by the river. <laughs> <laughs> they've got this basically warehouse building that just does meat processing. But they bring some of their own recipes and some of that stuff into it. And Fantastic. it's it's excellent especially even with a wild hog. So many people think, oh, wild hog, it's, you know, what do people call them now, pasture roaches? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they're like, oh, it's this big nasty thing. But it can be so good, especially if you're using it, like using the right German sausage recipe. Absolutely. So I ended up coming home. Uh, yeah, it, we, so we shot the pig on Saturday night. And on Monday night, I took it out. No, Tuesday night. Uh, no, Monday. It was Monday night. I took it out, cut it up deboned it all but one shoulder because we're going to actually do a shoulder uh, shoulder smoke later this weekend. Yep. Um, and then I took all that meat in and I'm pretty excited. I'm pretty excited to get, I've never had from Kubi's um, pig sausage and I'm pretty excited to see how that tastes. So what do y'all, do you get spicy breakfast? I got spicy breakfast and then the rest of it, jalapeno cheddar. Man. That's, those, those jalapeno cheddar links are just You're so going to have like 50 pounds of sausage I'm links. i a lot of sausage. <laughs> and then I have an axis that's still aging. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's the premium steak cuts and oh stuff Oh my gosh. Like that. I'm looking forward to it. And yeah, make those trimmings into stew meat or sausage or whatever. But Absolutely. Most of that will be so good. So man, in terms of... What all can you cram into a slightly exaggerated long weekend that wasn't actually that long? It was Friday night through Sunday night. It went from seeing cool animals on the highway, seeing deer, working on a feeder, seeing black buck, two guys getting out to a thousand yards, going back to the feeder, shooting a pig, cleaning the pig, getting a little bit of sleep, driving halfway across the state again, getting on an axis buck, you nailing your first axis buck, beautiful animal taking that back getting some good tex-mex a lot of time on the highway <laughs> lots of road, road but if you drive. live in texas it's just kind of like get used to it you're gonna put a lot of miles on your truck but i don't even mind the drive anymore it was an adventure it was a good weekend it was it was a hell of an adventure and we accomplished all three of the goals i set out for and had a lot of fun doing it yeah doesn't get better than that all right hope you guys enjoyed it this was fun i had a blast just kind of recounting all the memories from this last weekend and just hanging out with daniel until next time stay safe be free and never stop seeking adventure